Good morning, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Someone beat me to it. So let me begin with the blessing over the Torah portion. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kedashanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu L'asuk B'davrei Torah. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has made us holy through his commandments and commanded us to engage in study of the words of Torah. Amen. So today, we come to a new Torah portion. And I would like to first give you an idea of where we are going with this Torah portion. If I can get this to work. If you were to walk out of this room right now, there are two things I want you to take away. Two things I want you to remember from Vayeshev. First of all, our walk as believers is not supposed to be easy. This is not a pleasure cruise, ladies and gentlemen. Our walk is not supposed to be easy. Also, I want you to look at this Torah portion as a roadmap for dealing with your own inward struggles and also standing strong in the face of temptation. So these are the two things I want you to focus on. These are the two central core nuggets. You all can leave now. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> okay. Our Torah portion begins with Genesis 37 and verse 1. Vayeshev Yaakov be'eretz migorei aviv be'eretz kana'an. Jacob was settled in the land where his father sojourned in the land of Canaan. So, Vayeshev, Jacob settled. That is the name of our Torah portion. I want you to look at Vayeshev. I'm going to go up one more slide. That's that word right there. That's a vav, a yod, a shin, and a vet. Vayeshev. He settled. And the name of this Torah portion is so important because I want you to keep in the two principles I shared at the beginning, right? Our life is not supposed to be easy. And we're supposed to struggle against self and overcome, right? So Vayeshev, he settled. Jacob sought rest. That is the premise of this. Vayeshev is an interesting word. Because it, can mean, it comes from the roots yeshav, which can mean to dwell. But it also comes from the root, same root, yeshav, which means to sit. Right? Psalm 1.1 says, Happy ashrecha ishasher, happy is the man who, uvmoshav, letzim lo yeshav, who in the seat of scoffers does not sit. You can see, lo yeshav, he does not sit. Yeshav is also related to the Hebrew word Shabbat. It means rest. So, this is what Jacob's looking for. He's looking for rest. He's looking for rest. It's kind of interesting because why is Jacob looking for rest? Why? Let's look at the last few Torah portions at Jacob's life. Has it been an easy life or a hard one? Let's look at the fact. His own brother tried to kill him, wanted to kill him, so he had to go to his uncle for safety, right? His uncle turns out to be a swindler. He works for the woman he loves, only to be given her sister to him as a wife. There's struggles in the household as each wife is jockeying for the position of the favored wife. He has to deal with his uncle constantly changing his wages. He leaves, has to deal with his brother, who's he's, who's he's afraid of, of killing him. And then he watches his own daughter get violated. And then his own sons run and plunder and murder every man in a neighboring city. And he's worried that all the nations will come and attack him. And then his wife dies. And then 
He just wants rest. After all the trials and hardships, the man just wants rest. The Midrash is very interesting. And Rashi, the great sage, quotes it. And I'm going to, it's right there at the bottom. He abode. Jacob wished to live at ease. But this trouble in connection with Joseph came suddenly upon him. Basically what he's saying here is that Jacob wished to have an easy life after all the hardship. He wanted to retire, but because of that, because he settled down, that's when Jacob's trouble, Joseph's trouble came upon him, right? When the righteous wish to live at ease, the Holy One, blessed be he, says to them, are not the righteous satisfied with what is stored up for them in the world to come, that they wish to live at ease in this world too? Think about that. When I was little, my father would sit me and my siblings down at the table and say, imagine this right here is your life on this earth. Put that right by the wall over there and measure the distance from the wall all the way to the barn across the street. Right? That is eternity. There are trials in this life. We have to struggle against ourselves. Sometimes we have to struggle against temptations. We have to struggle against our weaknesses. We have to struggle against the circumstances in our life that are beyond our control, some of which may be in our control, some of which we're helpless against. We have to struggle. It's a wrestle. It's a battle. But it's a refining fire. Because each and one of us is like silver. We're like gold. And when you take gold out of the ore, when you take the ore out of the mountain, right, out of the mine, it contains other metals in it like lead, copper, iron. And you have to put that in the fire so that those impure metals are extracted so that what is left is pure. Because when the kingdom comes and the temple is built, the physical stones are you, me, and each other, right? And we have to be pure. And this little life is when we're purified. Jacob sought rest. And it's interesting because it doesn't say Israel sought rest, but rather Jacob sought rest. There's a difference between the two. Israel is Jacob's potential. Jacob is the man. Because you and I have a potential. We have a destiny. But the human being inside us just wants it to be easy. We just want an easy life. We want the picket fence and the constant income and the steady life with no challenges. But we don't get purified through that. It's kind of interesting because you have Jacob who wants rest, but you also look at Joseph, who Joseph was. In Genesis 37, verse 2, it says, These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph was 17 years of age. So, first of all, going back to because Jacob wanted rest, the trials of of Joseph came upon him. He lost his son. Where did the rabbis get that? So, let me show you the Hebrew. Ele toldot, these are the generations of Yaakov. Ele toldot Yaakov, Yosef. Notice how you have that. Yosef immediately follows Yaakov. Ben Shava Eskleshana. Joseph was 17 years of age. Why 17? Why? He could have been 18 years of age. He could have been 16 or 15 years of age. But why did this come when he was 17? Because the numerical value of Tov is 17. Because when you take good, and you, the Hebrew word Tov means good, 
and you take the tet, which has nine. You take the vav, which is a numerical value of six, and the bait, which has a numerical value of two. You get two plus six plus nine, you get 17. To show you that in the midst of the trials that Joseph is about to face, he still maintains his identity because he sees the bigger picture. That it is all for good. And years later when he's reconciled with his brothers and his brothers are scared for their lives, he says, do not fear because God used the evil that you've shown me for good. It's all good. Tov is an interesting word. It's a word that is, can be used to show gratefulness. Praise the Lord for he is good. Hodu la donai kitov. Right? Ke le'alom chasdo. His steadfast love is eternal. And it's kind of interesting because his love is steadfast even when we don't feel it. So keeping that in mind, let's look at what happens to Joseph in this Torah portion. His brothers hate him because his father loves him. His father sends him on a suicide mission to check on his brothers. His father doesn't think it's a suicide mission, but Joseph knows it's a suicide mission, yet he submits to his father anyway. His brothers strip him of the very coat his beloved father gave him and throw him into a pit of empty, an empty pit filled with snakes and scorpions. There's a deeper meaning to that. Rashi and the Midrash talk about how that pit being empty was actually filled with snakes and scorpions. And when I read it, I'm like, where in the world did they get that? That sounds like a crazy statement. But actually, in the Middle East, when you have an empty pit in the ground, it's a metaphor for you and me. That if something, if there's no life, water in there, living water in your heart, and your heart is just a pit, something's going to fill it. Snakes and scorpions are going to fill that. And that's actually, that's common knowledge. If you have a ground in the desert and you have in the ground a hole in the ground, you're going to have snakes and scorpions. That's where they reside. So, they want to murder him, but decide to sell him to the Ishmaelites, who sell him to the Midianites, who sell him to the Egyptians, who sell him to Potiphar. If you're paying attention to the verse, you'll talk about how he sold to the Midianites and he sold to the Ishmaelites and the Egyptians. And the Midianites and the Ishmaelites are not the same. So it's shown he's repeatedly sold over and over again as a slave. Potiphar's wife makes advances and falsely accuses him, and he's thrown in prison and left to rot there. So the thing is, is his life easy in this Torah portion? No. It's not. And I'm going to get to this slide in a second. But it is, it's very interesting when you look at who Joseph is, right? He's a 17-year-old boy who's been stripped of his identity, right? He's a 17-year-old kid who's had his whole world turned upside down. He's watched everything fall away from him, right? 17 is an interesting age, too, because when the military here in our country, right, the United States of America, why do you think they let 17-year-olds join the military? Why do you think they let 18-year-olds join the military, and they want them at that age, between 18 to 20? Because their brain has not fully formed. You see, the human brain, especially in the young man, does not form until fully until he's about 24, 25 years old. This is medical, medical verified fact. What we're talking about is the decision-making part of the brain. It does not fully come together until you're 24 years old. So if the military takes you at 17 or 18, they take you at that age because your mind can be molded. And they can mold you into their image. 
So picture a 17-year-old boy sold into the most pagan society in the world at that time. The most immoral society at that time. His life has been thrown away. His identity has been stripped. And he has the potential. Most 17-year-old men, young men at that time, at any age, faced with a similar situation, would naturally assimilate. Because that is the time in their lives when their brain can most assimilate into that culture and change. But he is able to stand his ground. He is successful in his master's house. But then he is tempted. He is tested. When Potiphar's wife decides she wants to be with him. And it's kind of interesting. Because there are four places in the Torah. Let me backtrack. When we have Hebrew letters... And when you're reading the Torah, the Masoretic text, you have the letters themselves, you have the words, then you have the Hebrew letters that make up the words, you have the vowel points, and then you have cantillation marks, right? The cantillation helps me when I get up, if I am going to be canting Torah, to sing the melody of Torah. Because really, Torah is a song. And it was made to be a song in the days of Ezra, So the people could memorize the Torah in Hebrew. So that when you are working in the fields, God's word could be on your heart. And you could remember vast amounts of scripture. You could teach it to your son and he could remember your daughter. And she could remember because Torah was a song. Right? The note here, I have the olive in red. Because this note is called the Shal Shalet. And it only occurs four times in Torah. It's above. It's that jagged dot. And it's on this, in Genesis 39, verse 8. It's on the word that says he refused. He adamantly refused. This is when Potiphar's wife says, lie with me. He says, it, the scripture says he adamantly refused. Why is it a shal shalet? A shal shalet is the Hebrew word which means chains basically means you're overcoming your own chains. But it's a difficult process because it's an intense struggle. There's some delay, right? The first time it occurs in Scripture is when it's talking about Lot delaying, when the angels are trying to get him out of Sodom, and he's just delaying. He's dragging his feet. So the Shal Shalet, it's kind of like, I'm, I want to go this way, but I want to go this way, but I want to go this way, but I want to go this way. It's that jagged line you see on top of the shin right there. Right there. It's that cantillation mark. I want to go this way, I want to go this way. It's showing that as a 17-year-old boy, 17-year-old young man, he was faced with intense temptation. And there's a waiver. But he's able to overcome. And we'll talk about that more. Here's examples of the Shal Shalet, three of the four, including Genesis 39, verse 8 in Torah. It's talking about Lot did not want to leave his wealth in Sodom. Genesis 19, verse 16. Genesis 39, verse 8. Joseph refuses, but he almost gives in. Genesis 8.23, Moses struggles with feelings of jealousy. Why? Because he wanted to be a part of the priesthood, but that was for Aaron, his brother. As you can see, it represents a struggle, an inward struggle that's intense. It's an intense, prolonged situation that's agonized because you just don't know which way to go. In the case of Joseph, I want you all to think about What happens in Genesis 39, verse 8, is no small miracle. It's no small miracle that a 17-year-old young man can stand. And I won't read you the quote from the Midrash Rabbah. I'll just paraphrase it. But it basically asks the question, how can a 17-year-old boy stand, a young man, stand? He is... This is a young man who's outside of his father's house. Let's look at Reuben. 
in last week's Torah portion. Reuben, over here. Right? He's under his father's roof. He's much older than Joseph. He falls with Bilhah. Let's talk about Judah and Tamar that happens in Genesis 38. He marries a Canaanite woman. Right? He breaks the cardinal rule (laughs) of the sons of Jacob. He marries someone outside the camp who's from the land of Canaan. And then there's the whole situation with Tamar where he's unable to control himself. Right? These are brothers that are older under their father's roof. Over here, you have a 17-year-old boy who's been stripped at his, of his identity at the age where he is, his mind is malleable, moldable. Right? He's outside of his father's protection. He has no guidance outside of his own. And he still stands. And the Midrash asks, how is this even possible? And it answers. But this is a verse from Psalm 119. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. But how do you guard it according to your word? Joseph stood because he knew who was with him, right? Genesis 39, 2, it says God was with Joseph. It means that Joseph, in the midst of Egypt, in the midst of everything going on around him, he still whispered God's name under his breath. He did not let himself forget God. He made God the priority of his life. When it says God is with him, it means he's, God is there. He kept God real. It's kind of interesting because the rabbis have much wisdom to offer. And they talk about to keep yourself from sin, you must keep God in front of you at all times. The ethics of our fathers, which is a part of the Jewish Mishnah, says, A man who keeps himself from sin keeps into account three things. Above him are seeing eyes, a hearing ear, and a hand that writes in the book of life or death everything that he's done. And that is an approach to God based on fear, which is good. But Joseph also loved God, and he knew that God was real with him. And it's also showing what kind of God we serve too when it says God was with Joseph. This is a God in who, one of the Psalms I learned when I was a little boy, my mom made me memorize this, Psalm 27. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. It's from that psalm. When my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will take care of me. And the Midrash says, God saw Joseph alone and by himself, and he made himself real to Joseph. God personally took it upon himself to make sure Joseph would stand. Joseph also stood because he recognized the danger of his situation. And the Midrash offers a very interesting parable. It talks about a bear comes raging into this town. And on the bear are a bunch of jewels, costly jewels, the most costly jewels in the whole world. And everyone in the town sees this bear raging into the town. And they're like, if I can get the jewels off the bear, I'm going to be wealthy. And then a wise man looks at the bear and says, we all need to run because we're going to (laughs) die. That's how Joseph viewed his situation with Potiphar's wife. Where most men, most people would have been like, go for it. It's going to be awesome. Joseph recognized the danger. Where did we get that from, by the way? Where did the Midrash get that from? Vahi ish matzliach. He was a successful man. Matzliach, the root of that is a sari alamed and a chet. 
and you go to 2 Samuel 19, verse 18. Vitzalchu, Sadi, Lamed, Chet. They rush down to the Jordan ahead of the king. It represents running. It's a rapid movement. It's not just that he's successful, he knows when to run from temptation. And I'll be honest, one of the areas where I struggle in my sin, my own personal sin, is many times I forget to run. I forget to run. And going back to the Shel Shalet, here's another key thing about the Shel Shalet. That jagged, he refused. This rabbi I talked about, I listened to this week in Kabad.org's article called The Difficult Note. It talks about this agony of Joseph that he had to go through. It talks about that note. And it says he eventually was able to stand because when we are presented with a trial or sin, many of us put one hand out and say, no. But the other hand is right here beckoning it back. But when we put two hands out, we're saying, stay away. But sometimes that sin is so strong that you can't overcome with your bare hands. You can't overcome with your bare strength. So that's when you run. He knows when to run. And it's kind of interesting because this is actually a New Testament concept. It's not just an Old Testament Torah concept. It's also a new Brit Chadashach concept. And you all know Ephesians 6. And you can see the letters that I have in red. It's like, be strong, take your stand, stand. It's talking about struggle. Be alert. Keep on praying with all kinds of prayers and requests. It's talking about the spiritual warfare that we all go through. First of all, notice that it's called a struggle. It's not supposed to be easy. This is not a pleasure cruise. This is not time to sit and relax. This is not time to retire. Our retirement is not in this life. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's, it's supposed to be a struggle because we're being refined. I sometimes read from the Apocrypha. I don't view it necessarily as biblical truth, but I think it's very interesting sometimes. And this week I had the opportunity to read from the 12 Testaments of the Patriarchs. That is, and it's a part of the Apocrypha reading. It is each of Jacob's 12 sons before they died, they each wrote to their sons like a letter talking about their lives. And I read through it a long time ago and I recently revisited Joseph's testament. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of the Apocrypha contradicts the Bible, but actually the 12 Testaments of Joseph don't. The 12 Testaments of the patriarchs don't. They actually very much affirm Torah. And they talk about these 12 human beings, right? Sometimes we look to them and we look to when they stand and we look at, up to them like they're almost God level and when they fall they're like how did they do that? And you realize when reading the 12 Testaments of the Patriarchs they were just human beings like me and you. Right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. But anyway the 12 Testaments of the Patriarchs talked about especially in Joseph's part that he was able to stand because, first of all, he prayed. There was a lot of fasting that took place with him. Fasting was a big part because he's learning how to deny the flesh. It's like we talk about feeding the dog, which dogs to feed. When Joseph was fasting, he knew which dog he was feeding, which dog he wasn't feeding. But the only way Ephesians 6 tells us other than wearing the armor of God, is to constantly be praying. That's the way you overcome in spiritual warfare. That's the way you overcome against your own battles. It's not an easy thing, but you always have to be alert. You always have to be praying. Also, you have to know who you are. 
Because in, in Egypt, it's easy to lose your identity. In the modern day Babylon, the modern day Rome, the modern day Persia, the modern day Greece, the modern day Rome, it's easy to lose your identity. When sin is on demand, or in even struggles, just circumstances you can't control, maybe they're not morally related, are facing you. It's easy to forget who you are, but you can't do that. And the biggest thing you need to remember is you're bought with a price. And when it doesn't feel like that, therefore honor God with yourself, with who you are. Flee from sin. And when it says flee sexual immorality, what it's talking about on a spiritual level is flee idolatry. On a physical level, flee sexual immorality, but on a deeper level, flee anything that comes between you and your God. And also remember that this life that you are walking right now is not supposed to be easy. I'm going to say it again. You signed up for a war the moment you gave your life to Messiah. You signed up for a war. You made yourself a child of the king, the enemy that we fight against, as it says in Ephesians 6, hates the king. And he hates you because you are children of the king. He hates me because I'm a child of the king. And I swore allegiance to the king. And because I called the king my father. And knowing that this walk is not going to be easy, I need to know how to stand. I need to pray. I need to find how, how I can fast. I need to find out when to stand and when to run. All right, I'm going to leave it open for discussion. Michael, or someone, can you please pass the mic around? Well, I, I know, but we got people at home who are listening, and we want them to hear you. Okay, the word... Is it on? Yeah. The word says, commit your ways into the Lord, and he will sustain you. Mm -hmm. If you do that, and you're focusing on him, he's going to make this walk easier, right? He's going to open up doors, close doors, so it won't be as difficult. difficult. But there are still going to be challenges. There's still going to be challenges that you have to face. And a lot of times we can't change our circumstances, right? When we step out of the boat and walk to Yeshua, we can't change the waves around us. But we can change our perspective. Instead of looking at the big waves, I can look at Yeshua and keep my eyes on him, and then I don't notice the big waves as much. So in essence, he'll make that, that temptation less than if you had not committed. Correct. It's called he will provide a way out. But we have, and it's not just a temptation thing. It's also maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with just a life circumstance. And just walking in trust. Because it's easy to get wrapped in whatever that is and take your eyes off of Yeshua, take your eyes off of his Torah, take your eyes off of God's goodness. Lori. Mike. Yeah, so concerning will he make our way easier, um, you know, it reminds me of what the, Paul said in the book of James. Or James. He says in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying your, of your faith works patience. But let patience have your perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. It's, um, you know, who really follows, um, you know, the God we claim to serve? And we, it's really hard to know until trials come our way. It's easy to follow you know, when everything's going grand. And uh, so um, the way that's what we would term easy, um, you know, he may see, he sees it differently. He's going to put things in your path that are going to shape you and form you. And, um, and so that's why we have to trust in him, you know, with all our heart and not lean mm -hmm. under our own understanding. And uh, it says that he will direct our paths. 
And so, yeah, life is, is going to be full of trials, but it's a test. Just like when Israel came out of Egypt, he brought them out of Egypt. And mm -hmm. the, the, the way to the promised land was a, was a trial all the way. And it was to yeah. prove them whether they would obey him or not. And so, um, but having this kingdom vision is what I like to call it. Joseph had that. And that's how he was able to, to look at every circumstance and know that, uh, you know, my God put me on this planet for a specific purpose. And uh, the paths that he, he, he leads me in, I, I know that at the end that all things work together for good. Joseph knew who his master was. He was constant. And that's like a big thing for us, knowing who our father is. Um, Donnie, I just wanted to commend you on laying that out so beautifully. I just really like the way that you presented um, Joseph's story. I have two pieces I want to add to that. When I was in Israel, uh, we were on um, Joshua's not really mountain, but there was a lady named Bacha, and Bacha is called the, the mother of the mountain. And we went into one of the cisterns that Joshua had built near mm. the monument, and she started talking about Joseph being thrown in and empty, it said, without water. So that would have been the scorpions and the snakes that mm. he was thrown into that cistern. So that's pretty common knowledge back there. So I just wanted to add that to this. But the other thing that I keep thinking about, because I'm a holistic thinker, is Joseph, and, and if you look at the pattern of um, how the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives individual prophetic dreams. So Joseph had these prophetic dreams much younger than 17 or right around 17, where I believe what happens is the Holy Spirit will activate those dreams later on in the future. Hmm. But I think the Holy Spirit also kind of rests in your heart so that there's some sort of resolution in your heart hmm. because of that prophecy that's going to come down down the, the pathway. And I keep thinking of Mary, you know, Daniel resolved in his heart, and they were both very young folk, like 14, 15. Hmm. So I, I, I think of that, the prophecy of the dream, from the Holy Spirit kind of resting in your heart to also give you that resolve to stand firm. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because we're told men like Daniel resolves in his heart. And you notice that the wicked men in the Bible say in their heart, like Haman said in his heart, like he was almost going along with what his heart wanted. But men like Daniel... They tell their heart what to do. Okay, I have a question, Donnie. Um, this is just a question about the overall Torah portion. I don't know if you know in your studies this week if you came upon this, but so the portion goes with talking about Joseph and his life, seems to hit the pause button, then we hear about Judah and Tamar, and then it, then it resumes again. Oh, and then Joseph was blah, blah, blah. And it continues with his life. Do you know why that story is sandwiched in between? I don't know. Okay. I can guess. But I think this is just what hit me personally. Is when you look, it makes the story of Joseph so much more powerful. When you see a righteous older brother fall. When you see a righteous older brother fall, and you realize that with Joseph it was a miracle that he stood. Because he could not have stood if he was just by himself. There's other theories the rabbis go into that aren't necessarily talked about in the Bible. I don't necessarily see biblical proof for them that I won't get into today. But, yeah, that's my guess, just based on the text itself. So, I, One I have a question. Um, Keep your hand up. So, go ahead, in the, in, you had pointed out, like, the sins of the brothers, what they had done, and then Joseph, who didn't at that point in time, and he, fall to sin. And he had a lot less going for him. And he, but my, my question is, but before that, do you think it was justified that the brothers hated him in the aspect of how it's speaking biblically I, 
That's actually a question that I don't really have an answer to that I've asked myself. It's kind of interesting. I, I've heard the rabbis talk about they were concerned with, they've looked at the arrogant brothers in the past in the family line like Ishmael and Esau, and they're like, those brothers were kept out of the promise. We need to keep this one out of the promise. That is one theory. But Scripture also talks about how the brothers could not speak peaceably with him. And the rabbis take that to mean that it actually was their, to their credit because they were actually honest people. That if you sometimes, you notice how in Second Samuel, the situation with Tamar, the king's daughter, where she is mistreated by Ammon, and Tamar's brother Absalom comes in, and while he's plotting to kill Ammon for mistreating his sister, he's talking to Ammon, but he's talking to him neither good nor evil. He's kind of talking in peace to him, but in the background, he's planning to do away with Ammon, right? Contrast that with this situation here, where the brothers don't even talk to him because they're like, if what's in our heart isn't good, then why fake it? So it's kind of to their credit. We got three minutes left. This kind of reminds me of where, in a way, when uh, they said that the, the, weren't the Jews blinded so that the Gentiles might see? Yeah. I mean, it's not that they were bad. It's just that they, there, there was a difference there, you know, I mean, and, and, but I have, I myself feel that it, I would rather be in a position where my back is against the wall or that I am in a trial, not knowing which way to go, because through that, I, I know I have to focus on Yahweh, hmm. you know, I mean, those trials are a blessing in disguise. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Because there have been times in like my walk where trials have happened and I've been mad at God. And then there have been times where I trusted in God in the midst of my own struggles. And I, I, I felt this like sense of peace. Like knowing that I was held. And that is a powerful feeling. Someone else. Back yeah, to you. That to, to maybe help answer Kevin's question, did they have a, were they just in um, their their cause against Brother Joseph? Um, I'm, it takes me back to a, a couple of verses in Scripture, in Psalms, and also in John 15. And uh, again, it goes back to kingdom vision. We're all born, God has a purpose for each one of us, and and, unless we realize that, um, you know, we'll look at others, you know, in in the wrong worldview, if I can say that. Um, You know, when David was, uh, um, you know, going through his struggle, he he mentioned how he was hated without a cause, and uh, Joseph was a type of Messiah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what happened in Joseph li- Joseph's life pointed to what Messiah would go through. And we know that Yeshua, he mentions in John 15, that, you know, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Yeah. He was hated without a cause. So the brothers didn't have a cause to hate Joseph for. But it, again, it was prophetic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and his brothers didn't understand their kingdom vision, much like you know, Yeshua, when he came, you know, uh, you know the, the, the Jewish uh, people, the Israelites, you know, they hated him without a cause. They, they didn't see the, understand the kingdom vision. Yeah. And uh, so that's why in this life we'll get bogged down with the things around us because we forget our kingdom vision. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just like Tamar, you know, she had kingdom vision. You know, I did a study on this a while back. 
Um, you know, Adam had kingdom vision. You know, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, um, Jacob. You know, they all looked ahead. You know, Abraham searched for a city. You know that God talked about. That was his. That was his vision. So everything that came his way, it didn't falter. You know, they may have, you know, stumbled here and there, but their eyes were on that city. You know, yeah. and, and and it's our responsibility is is whether we're, you know, uh, and I'll just speak as a husband, we're to help our spouse across the finish line. We're to help our children across the finish line. That's the whole goal of, that was the whole goal of Israel, to help the nation see who the true God of heaven was and help them fill you know, that, that home that he's building for his children. And so, um, so yeah, they didn't have a cause to hate him. Um, I mean, in their own mind they did, but it was for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Give it back to Kevin, please. All right, so I saw, I got the timeout signal. I got the timeout signal. So this week, I'm going to close with a blessing over the Torah that I always close with. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has planted everlasting life in our midst. Amen.